when um, I saw the agenda and I realized I was following Bob, um, I thought the best way for me to honor Bob was to uh, start with uh, a lesson that I learned in his class when I took his class a few years ago. So I took World Regional Geography with Bob, I don't remember how long ago it was, maybe six years ago? And uh, one of the things that he talked about in his class was something called historical memory. So when I say historical memory, what comes in your mind? This is going to be interactive. When I say historical memory, what do you think of when I say that? You can raise your hand and I'll call on you. Okay, a moment in time. What else? Anybody got anything? Bob can't answer because I want to see. Nobody else? Yes, says Mm-hmm. Perhaps, yeah. Those are all great. Anybody else got anything else? Sarah. Your perception of history. Oh, so um, Elmer said, moment that perhaps changed history. Sarah? Your perception of history. Your perception of history? All of those are sort of correct and also what's interesting. Yes, Mike? Yeah, collective is part of it, but what it actually has to do with is group history. So you're all correct, but it has to do with how we experience it as a group. So, how old is the United States? You don't have to get out your calculators about how long. How old is the United States? 240 years as a country, right? And the first settlers came in 1607 from Europe, right? First European settlers. So, and then you've got your Spanish settlers that come in the 1500. So, our historical memory as a country is less than 500 years old. But one of the things, and Bob didn't really share this, um, and I'm going to share a little bit about Bob, um, taking his class, World Regional Geography, every place that he talked about, he lived. He lived in India. He lived in many places in the Middle East. And he shared with us and talked to us about the historical memory in those countries that are that's literally thousands of years old. And when you have thousands of years of history to call upon, right? and those of you who are uh, of uh, Judeo-Christian or, or Islamic origins in your religious faith, you know that the those three religions all come from those areas, right? So you're talking about 2,000 years at least, right? 3,000 years, 4,000 years, Old Testament, New Testament. That's a lot of history. So people don't get over that history very quickly. Things that are going on right now in those areas, and my students will say, why is that? I'm like, well, let's go back about 4,000 years. And then we go back 3,000, then 2,000, bring it up. So some groups of people have not liked each other in some regions of the world for thousands of years. And where do you learn that? Where, not just in school, but where do you think these people in those other areas of the country or other parts of the world have learned about those animosities? From their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents, right? So it becomes a part of who you are as a person because that's your history, even though that history might be 2,000 years old. So what about in this country? We have a 500-year-old history and we have internalized the way we treat other people based upon history. So last year, six, uh, 2019, was the 400th anniversary of the very first Africans arriving in the United States. Did you know that? First Africans arrived in 1619. And we spend time in my classes talking about how those first Africans didn't come in as slaves. The first Africans came in probably as indentured servants, that their indenture was a little bit sh uh, longer than that of Europeans because it cost more. Africans actually cost more initially. But over time, Africans began replacing Europeans as indentured servants. And then by the 1670s, 1680s, 1690s, you have what we think of as permanent bondage. You're born a slave, you die a slave, your children are slaves, your grandchildren are slaves, your great-grandchildren are slaves, and so on down the line, right? So I hear people say all the time, well, that slavery, that was a long time ago. 
They need to just get over that. Have you heard that? I hear that in the media all the time. So slavery ends in 1865, right? Or does it? Guys from Jim Crow? You also know that if you've actually opened up, I encourage you if you'd like to even read this, if you don't believe me, um, Google 13th Amendment and read the entire thing. People go, oh yeah, 13th Amendment and slavery. Is there an exception? What is it? Anybody Punish know the exception? Huh? Yeah, it's punishment for a, a criminal conviction. Criminal conviction, yeah. And at the same time that the 13th Amendment is passed and they say, okay, well, we can still enslave you, force you to work against your will if you've committed a crime, right? So those criminals are gonna go to jail, they have to work, right? And we all say that's okay. So who decides what those laws are that might put you into jail? Well, who do you think's been deciding the laws from the 1600s up to the 1800s, which is when Jim Crow starts. White males. White males. Now, this is not going to turn into a white male bashing talk. But I do think it's important to note that white men have had, are the ones who have been creating those laws, right? Now, white women benefit from those laws. So, I'm a white woman, if you didn't know. I'm a white woman, and I uh, teach Chicano history, I teach African American history, and the first thing I do on the first day of class is I say, guess what, I'm a white female. And then I say, guess what, I have privilege. And no, I did not enslave you in my African American history class. Like that. But that doesn't mean that I'm not partially benefiting from that 450 year old history in our country. Does that make sense? I share that at the very beginning, and then it gets it out and they go, what? Because the word privilege makes people really uncomfortable, because they say, oh, well, privilege, that means you think I got everything for free. I worked my ass off for my degree, two degrees. And I'll tell students that. I had two kids while I was in college. I had one, one semester, I had four W-2s for four different jobs, and they weren't four different jobs in the same year. It was four jobs at the same time plus going to school, and changing diapers. Uh, and I remember missing class because I didn't have childcare. That's what Rodolfo said a minute ago about childcare. Yeah, I remember doing that. So, yeah, I worked really hard. But there's things I didn't have to work at. Like, I walked into a room and I was treated fairly. I walked into a room and I wasn't treated like I was a second-class citizen. Now, my womanhood has, I've encountered things like that because I'm female. But I've also encountered privilege being a white female that African-American women and my Latina sisters don't experience. Because white women are sort of put on a pedestal. We're pedestalized. So that Victorian womanhood stuff. But Latina and African American women are oftentimes treated as, it, it's, it's actually called the, the, the Mary Eve dichotomy, Eve being the fallen one, or the Jezebel. That's a biblical term. Jezebel was a queen in moved a, 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 I'm sorry, a Judean king away from God. So that Jezebel. So in other words, you're a whore. I speak real. If you're, yeah. and this is how I talk in class, too, by the way. So that's, that's the stereotype. So I get pulled over by the police. And yeah, I sped. Trust me. I, I speed. I work at West Hill. Do we all speed? That's how we all get to work on time, right? But I don't have to worry about, other than, and then I just got a ticket. I don't have to worry about whether or not the police officer is going to see me as a threat because he's not going to see me as a threat. Because I'm a nice little lady. That's privilege. So what happens in our classrooms 
is a collective historical memory of our students. They bring that with them. They bring it with them. And so we have to acknowledge that. We have to recognize that. And oftentimes, it's not even something that our students are fully aware of. <coughs> what they know are the messages that they've heard, the stories they've heard, and they internalize them. I'll give you an example. So the very first semester I taught African American history, which was like five years ago, um, it was a spring semester, and um, I had a student, she sat in the front row, um, and she, is, she works for the college now. And um, as we were talking about the content, and she shared with the class the very detailed and grotesque lynching of both of her grandparents. This student is younger than me, I'm 48. She's younger than me, a lot younger than me. I think she's in her like 30s. So that's a lot younger than me, no, no, I'm old, anyway. So she shared that her grandparents, her grandmother was raped in a field and set on fire. And her grandfather, because somebody wanted their land, they killed him and then he set the house on fire to try to hide there. That happened in the 1960s. What Bob said a minute ago when he was talking about the gypsy camps, and that was in the 1960s. How many of you were alive in the 1960s? I can't raise my hand up 71. It's okay. Okay? How many of you know people who were alive in the 1960s? School desegregation happened in, in some of you, your lifetimes or your parents' lifetimes. So as we hear our parents and our grandparents tell us the stories of the way that they were raised, we internalize that. Their history becomes our history. Their stories become our stories, and then we internalize them. So as people of color, those stories of oppression are internalized, but then you all, and then you also begin to realize that as people treat you a certain way, you're like, you go, is that because they're just jerks? Did I do something wrong, or is it because I'm female? Is it because I'm a person of color? Is it because, you know, why? I think a lot of times, whites, I don't know that white people have to deal with that same thing. I often think about myself as a female, and, but when women, when I deal with women, I don't think about that prejudice, but when I deal with men, sometimes I do. When, when I'm belittled by, someone, I ask myself, is that because I'm a woman? Or is it just because maybe I said something stupid? Or maybe they're just a jerk. But that my womanhood, which is the part of me that's a minority, even though women are 52% of the population, even more after a really horrible war, um, seriously. So, but yet a minority, right? And that's because a minority, we think of as a number, but minority has to do with your access to power. That's what minority really is. So even in California right now, where 40% of the population is Hispanic, that's of the 2010 census. I don't know what this year's census is going to look like. Yet Hispanics are still a minority because they have limited access to power. And think about what the media does with that. How am I doing the time here? I don't know. I've lost track. Okay. So what the media does with that as well. Does the media do a good job of portraying who we really are? I mean, any of us. Think about our groups, think about where we're from, think about who we look like, what we look like. Does the media do a good job of portraying that? No, it's catastrophic. <laughs> I remember my, um, uh, I, uh, my ex-husband was from Mexico, and his sister gave me uh, a Christmas gift, a very first gift, Christmas, that I was part of the family, and she had given everybody in the family uh, hoodies, zipper hoodies. I got crystal wine glasses. It was a beautiful gift, don't get me wrong, beautiful. But I sort of was shocked, and she says, well, I knew you would like that, because Garbatitas drink wine with their dinner. 
you guys know what a double chico is? It's a white girl, like the Spanish word. I don't actually drink wine. I mean, I do now. I wasn't much of a wine drinker then. <laughs> but where did she get that idea from? What do you think? I mean, where did she get that idea? From the, yeah, from, from TV, right? Yeah, because that's what, that's what I'm going to like. It, it, was, it, was, uh, it was the first time that I stopped and said, wow, we don't know each other. Like, I mean, as people, we don't know each other. Not just she doesn't know me, but we don't know each other. Because everything that we know is the media. So when I walked into, when, when I walked into my, my classroom this last fall, my Chicano history classroom, and I thought, I'm walking in, and with the way the media is behaving right now, and the voices about particularly the Latino community, it hits me hard that my students might think maybe because she's white, she hates me because I'm Latino. I wonder if that teacher supports the wall and doesn't want me here. Am I in a safe space to discuss the fact that I'm a DACA student? Because those are issues we're gonna talk about in class, right? And I tell them that. So how do I diffuse their fear on day one of me? Not just as their teacher, as the same on the street, but I'm a white, educated, middle class woman. And I've always been that. My dad was in the army. So my, I've always been raised, I mean, I won't say we were, I won't say we were rich, but we always had enough food to eat. I didn't struggle in many ways the way that our students struggle. So how do you bridge that gap? How do you create trust? You can't just say, well, you know, I know you guys have had it rough, but yeah, me too, man. I mean, I tell the diaper change. Yeah. And, and, and my students who are parents get that. That's one way I can connect. But I think sometimes it's okay to tell your students, there's things about you I don't get, but I'm really open to learn. So I tell my students, I can teach you what's in this book. We use Rodolfo Acuna's book. I said, we can talk about it, I can teach you the history. But I can't teach you what it's like to be Chicano in the United States, Mexican American, I think. And I can't teach you what it's like to be African American. And not everybody in my African American history classes is African American. <coughs> not everybody in my Chicano history classes is Chicano. But I tell them that we're going to learn from each other. Because if we don't learn from each other, why are we even here? Because as Sue said, we need to continue our education forever. And every day I get a fifth of I'm going to end with one of our newest faculty members in the morning. Yeah, I'm going to call you that. Rosanna, she and I sat together at lunch yesterday and had a conversation. I found out some really cool stuff about what she used to do at her old college. And this morning we traded books. She's got a book. I'm like, oh, I want to read that. And I'm like, I think you should read this. So we did a book trade. We should all be trading books. We should all be learning from each other what we know. And that's what I think is so awesome about this. So you just want to keep in mind what your students' history is, but let them share it. Don't create it for them. And if you're not sure, ask. Most people don't mind being asked. Believe it or not. They're like, oh, you noticed that I'm, like, don't just say, what are you? But where are you from? What's your background? People don't mind talking about themselves. They appreciate the fact that you might actually be interested. And don't be afraid to share who you are as well. So that's it. I'm done. Did I get time? <laughs>